introduce uh, myself and Dr. Stacy. Uh, I'm Dr. Deadboar. This is Dr. Stacy. Um, uh, we are board certified and licensed chiropractic physician. I'm also a naturopathic doctor. And um, welcome to uh, what we hope is a breath of fresh air regarding brain health. And um, uh, giving you a very much a systemic look at the whole thing. Um, this is part of our continuing series. Every month we do a different series uh, of things. Um, uh, this is a, a, a bit of a difficult topic uh, for us to go through. Uh, so what Dr. Stacy and I decided is to at least make you aware of the topics that affect the brain and then really pick the most important ones that apply to us and go into those in detail. Because if you go into everything in detail, we're going to be here next week. Uh, so so, so that, that is the way we've decided. So I, I know being holistic means we've got to be very complete with it all. Um, so at least we're, we'll raise awareness tonight of, of the complete picture and then again focus on the key, a few key elements. Brain health. Wow, what a topic and what an important topic. Um, I remember back in the mid-60s um, uh, going with my dad uh, doing f uh, house, not house visitation, just visiting sick people and elderly. He'd sometimes drag me along, we'd walk along and go visit that person and go visit this person. And um, I remember some of the elderly people back then, remember these people were probably born in the 1880s at that point. Um, uh, them being somewhat forgetful, uh, uh, sometimes acted a little bit strange, I thought, as a kid. Um, but I'm, I'm searching back in my memory and to see the total Alzheimer look that we see today so frequently just did not meet up with that. Some forgetfulness, oh absolutely, uh, it was there, but that total vacant look of Alzheimer's where nobody's really home, things are not hitting at all. Uh, you just did not see that in the mid 60s in the, what was then the elderly, uh, elderly population. So things are changing incredibly now. We're, now here we are 40 years later and um, we're, we're seeing uh, an unbelievable amount of uh, uh, cognitive issues. Uh, one out of four of us is expected to develop one or another sort of brain disorder. That's one out of four. And to me, that is so depressing. And we're going to go through the, uh, the etiology, the causes of that. Uh, Dr. Stacy will first go through uh, uh, some anatomy, uh, some neurotransmitter stuff, uh, some of the basics uh, and, and it's it's something that we kind of went back and forth on should we do this should we not uh, it's really important stuff um, so let's let, let's go through some of that and then we're going to go through some conditions and causative agents and therapies that we do in through here and again we could be here for just such a long time so we're going to try to really focus on really just what we think is the most important stuff for now and also what you can do about it and hopefully make it practical. So fasten your seat belts, welcome to Brain Health and uh, we're, uh, we're gonna take off with it, go for it. Sounds great. The one in four chance of uh, becoming having a mental disorder increases when you're on the Western diet. Very sorry for all of us because that means we're probably two out of four, 50%, yay! Look at all the fun. Uh, we're gonna start out tonight with a little bit from Hippocrates father of medicine, man way before his time. This gentleman was very intelligent. From the brain and from only the brain arise our pleasures, joys, laughter, and jests, as well as our sorrows, pains, griefs, and tears. Brain controls everything and that's what we're going to touch on a little bit tonight. Now this evening we are not going to be touching heavily on food. I know a lot of our seminars talk a lot about what we should be eating and how we should be exercising and those kind of things. Tonight we realize that those are very important for brain health, but there's so much more that has to go on through the brain and we've got so much packed in here tonight that we just want to let you know that those are still important. Yes, we know we're not covering them, but just do a little disclaimer for you. Different sections of the brain that you're going to find uh, mental disorders are affecting. The frontal lobe of the brain, cognition and memory, concentration and speech happen through here. Classically ADD, ADHD. If you look at that and go down through and you can see exactly what an ADD or ADHD person is having a malfunction in that section of the brain. In the parietal lobe, 
This is sensory and body orientation. This can be Parkinson's area. We're not really sure where our body is in space. When we go to touch something, we start to shake. Occipital is more visual. Now this one's not going to be covered as much through tonight, but it is part of the brain and an important aspect to remember that can be affected even though it's not a primary. Temporal lobe, auditory for hearing, expressed behavior. So this can be bipolar. Memory information retrieval, Alzheimer's. I know that one's one that a lot of people are here for tonight. And it's great to see, I wanna say this, it's great to see everybody from all ages we have from the very young at the very front. <laughs> so it's great to see that we're all starting to think that we need to be proactive in our health instead of reactive as our Western society has been, very reactive. So when we talk about brain imbalances, things that can be signs and symptoms that we have precursors for brain imbalance later in our life that's showing up now. Headaches. I know many people suffer from headaches and I'm sure in the back of your head the first thing you're not thinking of is oh I'm predisposed for Alzheimer's or I possibly have a, a chance to get depression. Headaches can be one of those things. Chronic pain. Almost always across the board when chronic pain shows up we're looking at 5, 10, 15 year window before we're going to see some sort of brain deficit showing up. So these are things that are very important to start working with early. Definitely exercise, definitely lifestyle makes a big difference here. The other thing is regional depression or seasonal affective disorder. We in Michigan I'm sure at least know one if not more people that have been affected by seasonal affective disorder. On average, I would say about 90% of my patients come in with a vitamin D deficiency. About the same for you? Yeah. In fact, um, statistics here in Kent County is 94% of us are deficient by end of winter. Yeah. In the end of winter, maybe far away. We never know. <laughs> so think about last year. Last summer, we didn't have a lot of hot days. We didn't have a lot of sunny days where people would go out and expose their arms and their legs. The way that we get vitamin D mainly is through the sun. And if we don't expose our arms and our legs without sunscreen for up to 20 minutes a day, then we're not getting our maximum dose of vitamin D every day. So our body can build stores for that. So last summer, we already came off a deficient summer of vitamin D. And if we're not taking supplements or eating foods that help to support some of our fat-soluble vitamin intake, then we're going to run through the winter with vitamin D deficits. Very important. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about vitamin D. It's not going to be the primary concern this evening. We're going to talk a little bit more about digestive health and uh, cardiovascular disease. But we will touch on some of these as we go through. Fibromyalgia. I know... A lot of people have this diagnosis underneath when they deal with hormonal imbalances, digestive complaints. Fibromyalgia tends to go with them. Fibromyalgia can be a disorder that has nutrient deficits. So when we have a deficiency in your nutrient in your gut that's not absorbing all the nutrients that we need, a lot of magnesium, calcium, your fat soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, that can lead to a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia later on can lead to other disorders. Eating disorders, that one's pretty self-explanatory. I don't think I would have to really explain too much on that. Metabolic syndrome, here's a great one. And I know we are going to hit this one hard tonight, so I won't spend a lot of time on metabolic syndrome. This is also called insulin resistance syndrome X. This one plays a very big role in Alzheimer's does have a lot of role to do in your depression along with bipolar issues. Schizophrenia is another one that seems to have um, a very large tie with metabolic syndrome. They're just now realizing, and Dr. Denbor is definitely going to elaborate more this evening, on how insulin affects the brain differently than it affects our body. So how we think of insulin resistance in our body that we just tend to put on more fat cells, it affects the brain in a completely different manner. So you can't always say, you know, whatever works down here is going to work up here. They are finding new things. Chronic fatigue, 
goes along with fibromyalgia, we tend to see those two tied together. Movement disorders, this is where restless legs comes in. Now I know a lot of patients don't think of restless legs as a possible neuronal deficiency in the brain. Parkinson's disease. And this one, if anybody's ever been through menopause, can say, okay, I know that there is a brain component here. I've either had anxiety or I've had some sort of depression or I get these flush things that go on and I want to just take off everything and fan myself down. So those all have to do with the brain. So it's not just a hormonal imbalance. That hormonal imbalance also drives neuronal imbalances. Autoimmune diseases. Unfortunately, autoimmune diseases have a very bad name and, and the reason why is when your body reacts the way it does in the autoimmune disease and heightens your immune response, then it also turns on your brain to an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response is what tends to kill cells. And that's what we're going to spend some time this tonight talking about how gluten can affect the body and how that can lead to insulin resistance as well. Cardiovascular disease. Scary thing is cardiovascular disease has a, a very strong tie into a lot of the disorders, depression, schizophrenia is one of them, bipolar, um, Alzheimer's also has some cardiovascular ties there. So this is one that, you know, genetically if we're predisposed, we should already be thinking 20, 30 years down the road. Um, but if we don't have a, cardi or a genetic predisposition for this, that doesn't matter. 50% of Alzheimer's cases have a genetic tie. The other 50%, they're not really sure of exactly what is the cause. Alzheimer's can have so many causes that affect it that the, we don't even know. We're grabbing at straws. It's just about everything that can show up. So I'm going to jump ahead one real quick here, Doc. Um, so precursors for Alzheimer's, because this is our next area we're going to be discussing, what I did is there's about three slides here of symptomatology. So what I'm trying to do is have you guys think a little bit more farther in advance. Let's be proactive. Do I have any of these things? Should I start thinking about what can I do to support my brain along with my body to help prevent this type of issue showing up? Reduced or absent dream recall. Does anybody not dream? I usually get at least one or two. And I have, I have quite a few patients that tell me, I don't remember the last time I had a dream. That's my first signal. Then I start thinking, let's, let's look at your brain. What else can we do to support your brain? Because if your brain is not working properly, how does the rest of the body work? The brain is the control house. Reduced sense of smell. This one I have a lot of women tell me about. You know, I just don't smell things the way that I have before. It, and sometimes it is a good sign they tell me with their husbands. <laughs> not really sure why. So, um, but yes, reduced sense of smell can be a precursor to having Alzheimer's. And Things you can get it about. back. Yes, you can. And we will be talking about some of the ways to get it back towards the end of the evening mm -hmm. with supplementation. Word finding difficulty, this is where we're struggling to put our sentences together, <coughs> or there's words that, you know, just not there, what, what would, you know, those kind of things. Experience of short-term memory loss. Family history of early onset dementia, this is where the genetic predisposition comes in. And this is where a lot of my patients say, I don't have anybody with Alzheimer's in the family. I'm really not worried about that right now. And, and I'm seeing reduced absent or absent dream recall, no sense of smell. And I'm thinking, we need to be worried about it because you're one of the 50% that doesn't have a genetic predisposition. Repeats things over and over. Experiences problems with simple calculations. There is a um, a very nice brain, it's retrain your brain, I do believe is what it is on. Um, reclaim. Reclaim your brain, thank you. <laughs> there, it's a little game that you can play on your computer to help support brain function. I was playing on it all weekend and thought, wow, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> pretty happy with my brain recall. But it, all you have to do is sign on and it's a free, free network for up to the first 40 tests and then it's a small fee after that. But it's very nice if you are worried about any type of brain loss memory loss. Reduce concern for hygiene. Now some teenagers, I will tell you some teenage boys, they, they don't mind, some are really picky, so we can't always look at that as a reduced need because we're burning the candle at both ends, I'm tired and I don't feel like washing my face. So that's not something that we have to look at in depth. But feelings of apathy or withdrawal, now this tends to go with more of a depression aspect. 
um, leading up to this, most people will tend to withdraw from their normal activities of daily living or from friends and just not interested in things that used to make them very happy. And that's when we start to look at, you know, what, what else is going on? Is it just as simple as, you know, working with some vitamin D, getting some exercise and balancing out um, their eating habits or are there other things that are deeper that we need to start dealing with? Poor abstracts. Thinking, low educational achievement or history of a learning disability. Learning disabilities, unfortunately, are running rampant now. Um, I think the last time I spoke to one of my younger kids in 4-H, she was telling me that there was something like 20 kids in her, in her class that she could think of that she knew was, were taking medicine for ADHD. And I thought, wow, that's pretty big for just a 13-year-old. You know, that you can remember 20 of your friends that, that are dealing with that. And obviously there's more than that, but very interesting things to think about. Recent onset of increased suspiciousness, disoriented at night, lacks concern about serious problems. Some of these are red flags anyway that you would automatically notice, but things to look at. So let me bring you back. And Dr. Denver's gonna talk a little bit about um, Alzheimer's and then we're gonna pick back up and I'll jump back in here in a few minutes. Thanks. So, Alzheimer's is something that we're picking on tonight, uh, but we're also going to cover the other behavioral disorders. But to, um, to continue with the Alzheimer's, uh, why don't I take both of those? Theme, um, let's create awareness of, of some of the factors that really affect Alzheimer's and then we're going to really dive in and go into some of the ma major ones that are associated with it. Um, one of the major things is insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome. We're going to come back to that one. Another one is gluten sensitivity. I'll come back to that one. Uh, one I'm not going to cover much tonight is heavy metal toxicity. Does it deserve to be covered? Yes, but we did so uh, late last year in one of our topics. And heavy metals have a profound effect on the brain. Uh, it is absolutely amazing uh, what it does, not only for uh, the, um, the Alzheimer model, but also for just behavioral disturbance model. Uh, one case comes to mind, uh, eight-year-old uh, comes in uh, to our office late last year, so this is just a few months ago, and had uh, symptoms associated with PANDAS, that's P-A-N-D-A-S. And so this is very bizarre, had occurred suddenly, overnight. So we're talking writhing motions. Uh, we're talking ticks, making animal sounds, not making eye contact. Just very disturbing behavior and could not function at school. And this happened overnight. Imagine your eight-year-old going to bed normal and then waking up with something like that. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, uh, this is not the first time this has happened in my office. Um, and uh, did a urine analysis on uh, this uh, eight-year-old and found a very high level of mercury. Had obviously been accumulating it, reached a threshold, maybe he was fighting a bug at the same time, something created the perfect storm. We immediately started doing some detoxification. Uh, we uh, implemented protocol to get the liver up and rolling, went with very high amount of vitamin D to try to stabilize uh, the brain as well as a lot of DHA oil. I'll talk more about that later, but that just feeds the brain. Uh, took them off of gluten because any food that could cause disturbance uh, in the brain, we, we, we took that away. Food colors, out. preservatives out, just a really strict diet. Recheck again a week later. A week later, I think we saw probably 70% improvement. Uh, checked a week later after that, all symptoms resolved patient today, two months later, is still on a detoxification protocol because I'm, I'm monitoring the mercury levels, watching it go down. Um, wow, what, what can you do for kids like that? It just with a quick intervention, this has an effect for life. Uh, heavy metals are profound how it affects you. I've seen, uh, you can go on Google and watch these little video clips of just very, very almost not measurable mercury gas. Uh, and, and they expose a nerve cell as it's growing. You know, the time-lapse photography is like a flower going open really quick. You can watch nerves grow that way also. 
uh, and this time-lapse photography shows the nerve dendrite growing exposed to just a little tiny touch of mercury barely detectable stops growing almost immediately keep on exposing mercury and it starts withering away it is a phenomenal video to watch especially considering the micro dose of mercury that this thing is exposed to so yes this is a big problem we uh, do test for it there are therapies in place to get rid of it uh, so it's something that we really need to um, to worry about as well gut we're going to cover in a little bit more de uh, detail but we're also going to skim through that we've covered this one a lot in the past the gut in europe is called the second brain uh, and for a big reason is because we share neurotransmitters with the gut so gut function doesn't happen just automatically you need neurotransmitters out there for the gut to move to secrete the enzymes for the bile duct to contract for the stomach acid secretions to be released all that takes neurotransmitters and a lot of them and in fact um, uh, university of Groningen that's uh, in my home country established that 90 percent of neurotransmitters in the body are actually found in the gut not the brain it's incredible and they did some profound research that showed that antidepressants such as serotonin reuptake inhibitors which just block reuptake of serotonin yes can have some effect in the brain but unfortunately because 90 percent of the neurotransmitters are in the gut also have the unwanted effect of being an SSRI in the gut wall as well affecting digestion and within six months have profound effect on digestion and how we absorb nutrients creating nutritional deficiencies which then contribute to depression so it goes round and round and round and so this this almost unbelievable data was was established about three years ago the Dutch government said I uh, don't know about this folks uh, this sounds a little weird so they had them repeat it uh, with gui under guidance of different different researchers found exactly the same results and it's now been replicated in Poland yeah so these antidepressants have a very negative a deleterious effect on gut function and may come back around and cause depression so uh, leaky gut syndrome uh, or intestinal dysbiosis as it's were as it's also known uh, which can lead to food sensitivities uh, profound we're going to talk about one of those foods gluten uh, but I can tell you that uh, uh, absolutely amazing some people tell you if they have corn syrup or they have a sensitivity to a certain fruit uh, or a preservative what a profound difference it can make we have some little patients here that I can always tell when they've had food colors I know they react to it you watch their pupils it's like a kid on drugs because their pupils just constrict and they look at you in a real angry way and just by that constricted angry look you can you can see uh oh we've had some chemicals the patient's not metabolizing it like like it should It's turning into a foreign chemical it's crossing the blood-brain barrier and it's really causing literally brain swelling they've proven this in monkeys on it with MRIs that the brain literally swells up it's inflamed it has a profound effect but it happens in the gut first so gut function is huge um, and uh, we're uh, unfortunately not gonna cover as much time on it as it deserves uh, hormones dr. Stacy is gonna cover some hormones uh, any woman will tell you that hormones affect brain uh, and uh, perimenopausal woman is, is so across the board when they start having symptoms that they tell me I think I'm getting Alzheimer's it is almost across the board and so it hormones have a profound effect on the brain and yes things can be done about that and Dr. Stacy's going to address that uh, right away and Dr. Stacy maybe you can address some of the research with Estrovir on that I know maybe it was not docket Estro Estro Ease yes um, would love that I, th I think uh, our audience would uh, would appreciate that one a lot and uh, energy metabolism this is mitochondrial function you may have heard me speak about it before but for those that, th that this is your first time here mitochondria are the producers of energy within the cells or little organelles it's very complex energy metabolism occurs there and we have tons of those in nervous system tissue and um, I had a patient in today and I told him today, I, I, you know what, I'm, I'm going to use you as an, uh, as an example. He was having neuropathy. You've probably heard of neuropathy before and very severe also. And right at the same time, he was also experiencing brain fog. 
and it was treated as uh, two very different things. Uh, I explained to him it's not. A nerve in your thumb or foot is also related to the brain, right? It's all nervous system tissue, it's just signals coming down. So obviously there is a connection. And he did get the diagnosis established at a neurologist, he said neuropathy, I can't feel anything with my feet, I'm having trouble walking, stumbling over things. This very active, healthy 76 young man, uh, 76 year young man was, was, was having real issues and aging because of it. So, uh, the neurologist did a lot of fancy instrumentation, established a diagnosis, told him, can't help you. Got a second opinion, can't help you. There are no drugs. We have some drugs to relieve the pain of burning, but nothing to help you. Came to me with the diagnosis and uh, we put him on nutritional protocol to help mitochondria come back. So get those things sped up again. It's a little bit like putting gunk in a carburetor. Well, that shows my age. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but cleaning out a carburetor or in fuel injectors to, to, to make it run uh, more smoothly and get, get the energy train rolling again. And, uh, and just watch. I told him, we're going to do this for at least three months. Uh, we can't turn this around uh, overnight. And lo and behold, six weeks later, all feeling has returned in his feet. Brain fog is gone. A non-curable condition cured. And here he was three months later or so, about four months, still saying, you know, Doc, I got to grab an inch of your, uh, of your uh, cards and I'm going to stand at the neurologist's office and I'm going to hand them out in the hall as they come out. <laughs> and I said, no, let's, let's not do that. I do want to maintain my reputation, uh, but I appreciate the, uh, the gesture very much. Thanks. Um, so, so uh, and, and this is not an isolated case, by the way. It is not an isolated case and it makes me sad to know some many people believe their doctors say this is an incurable condition whereas it's very uh, curable. We can say the same thing about a lot of cases of MS and, and, and neurological disorders like that. So, but let's, let's get back to um, Alzheimer's. Oh, I'm, I'm carrying this book around, you're probably wondering why. Um, but I, I did want to mention a couple of our sources for our information. And uh, one of them is Dr. J. Lombard. Dr. J. Lombard uh, is a brilliant neurologist. Uh, he, he's head of neurology department at uh, the Bronx Hospital. He heads that up. He's an associate professor at Cornell. Uh, he's a respected author, brilliant man, uh, who has really uh, been at the forefront in this country of a lot of the information you're hearing today. Uh, respect him very much. Uh, used a lot, we use a lot of his information in, in, this, uh, in, in this seminar. Um, a Dr. Susan Kraft, I'll be going through her latest research paper with you and dissecting it with you so that, that you get an, an idea of all the information that's out there. Uh, she is um, uh, head of psychiatry at uh, uh, University of Washington Medical School uh, and uh, a very respected pioneer, probably the number one authority in the world on insulin resistance and how it affects the brain. Uh, oh, Susan Kraft. Yeah, so absolutely brilliant gal. Uh, one of my colleagues also that I have to mention, Dr. Mark Hyman, uh, he is a very well-known best-selling author. Uh, he just released this new book, The Ultra Mind Solution. A uh, brilliant doctor uh, who practices uh, functional medicine like we do. Uh, this medical doctor uh, uh, has a way of writing the very complex into very understandable form. So a lot of the things that we cover tonight can also be found in su to some degree in, in this book here called The Ultra Mind Solution. And uh, he covers a, a wide spectrum and gives it the time it deserves. So this is definitely worth a look as well. So anything that you think, that, oh boy, I'd like to figure out more things of that, this might be a good starting point. Uh, the other people are researchers, and if you want to look up some of their papers, um, you can certainly do so. Um, but let's, let's hit Dr. Susan Kraft and see what she has to say in a latest sum up uh, article that she wrote in the role of metabolic disorders in Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Two roads converged. Um, this was published just la late last year in Neurological Review, a very uh, uh, well-known uh, neuro neurology uh, uh, journal. It's peer-reviewed, meaning that other doctors check it and say, yep, this is an, uh, a very good quality article. I found this on PubMed. Um, uh, they paid me pay $15 for it, <laughs> just for that. And um, it's, uh, but it's an, it was very, very worth it because it really, um, 
it really highlights a lot of the current research going on with insulin resistance and how it's related to various disorders and how it, uh, it, 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 it goes to, um, to Alzheimer's. So there's two forms of Alzheimer's. There's uh, vascular uh, Alzheimer's, uh, that's the first one. And there's the beta amyloid type of Alzheimer's. And beta amyloid is the one that you're most familiar with, is the classical Alzheimer's, and it has all the neurofibril tangles that you've heard about, or the beta amyloid formations, all the, the ex scar tissue-like formation in the brain that causes Alzheimer's, or so we thought. Now the thinking is starting to just get hints, well, maybe those are associated with Alzheimer's, but not the cause of Alzheimer's. So the thinking is becoming quite muddled in this whole thing. So let's go through some of the thinking that's out there. Um, metabolic disorders, this is doc quoting Dr. Susan now, uh, such as diabetes, obesity, hypertension, insulin resistance, and lipid or cholesterol disorders are all related to Alzheimer's. So this one little sentence is a profound statement for the medical profession. All of a sudden they're saying, hey guys, it's not one cause, one disease here. We're talking a plethora of conditions all affecting Alzheimer's. Isn't this revolutionary for them? I'm absolutely loving seeing this. And, um, and, and also very brave uh, because to stick your neck out like that uh, and come to this, you're, you are opening up yourself to a lot of volleys and she has been getting the volleys but she's been backing it up with good signs so so far the volleys have not leveled her at all. Um, so insulin resistance is considered a core syndrome that increases the risks of Alzheimer's disease and vascular Alzheimer's disease greatly. Um, and uh, she goes on to say uh, that prolonged peripheral outside hyperinsulinemia, so high insulin levels in the body associated with insulin resistance reduces insulin transport across the blood-brain barrier. This is a brand new finding and shocked the neurological world. In other words, if you have high insulin levels in the periphery, and high insulin levels is present in 40% of us, this is an epidemic problem, and how do you know when you have high insulin level? Well, one of the signs and symptoms is sugar levels that go up and down, right? So hypoglycemia, belly fat right here, your LDLs going up, total cholesterol going up, triglycerides going up, high blood pressure, and just apathy because your sugar levels in your brain is going down, so you're getting kind of dopey. Yeah, you don't have to have all of these things, of course, but those are some of the classic signs and or symptoms of insulin resistance. So insulin resistance causes decreased insulin, even though there's a lot of insulin floating in your body causing all this inflammation, which causes other problems, by the way, such as high blood pressure and high cholesterol and autoimmune diseases. And we can link it to anything, anti, uh, anything inflammatory. We're talking diabetes even, folks. Just, uh, we're talking uh, type 1 as well as type 2 diabetes. The, they're, they're starting to merge those two. Um, uh, this, this, this heightened inflammatory response doesn't just cause inflammation, but switches something in the brain called beta amyloid formation. And this scar tissue then sends signals to the rest of the brain and says, guys, I don't want this insulin. It's bad. So this beta amyloid formation is actually a protective mechanism. The body is doing what it's supposed to do. And it says, nope, no more insulin to the brain. Unfortunately, what happens is it shuts off too much insulin. And now what happens is not enough sugar is getting to the brain. So wildly fluctuating sugar levels in the rest of the body causing all kinds of damage from the neck on below, not enough up here. That is the end result. And the not enough sugar really affects neurotransmitter function profoundly. And the memory function is the first one to go and literally starts dying off. That is Alzheimer's disease. It is one of the main causes of Alzheimer's disease. And it is something that is very lifestyle related, isn't it? It is very lifestyle related. It is actually encouraging news because it gives us something to do. We can deal with this one. 
we can change lifestyle, make sure that insulin resistance goes out the window, and your chances of Alzheimer's has just been lowered dramatically. Exact percentage we don't know yet. The brain uses more glucose from the than any other organs in the body. Yeah, did you hear that? The brain uses more glucose pound per pound than any other organ in the body, so it's extremely sensitive to this hypo or low uh, glycemia. So then she goes on and covers various disorders and how it relates to, uh, to brain function. Insulin resistance related metabolic disorders. Um, so the, the first thing she covers is diabetes. And diabetes eventually causes uh, arterial damage. The arteries feeding the brain is going to be affected. So you not only have this insulin problem, but we also have an arterial problem. So the, the supply to the brain is, is affected, uh, making things worse. And then really interesting research also was done on obesity. Obesity, this is really interesting. What causes with, what happens with obesity is you have something called lipolysis, which is just a fancy word for fat, excessive fat breakdown. We got a lot of fat, so you're gonna have more fat breaking down. It happens. And something called free fatty acids are released. Free fatty acids are pretty toxic to the nervous system tissue. And we're finding that the free fatty acid, uh, FFAs, it's also called, has free access to the brain and does damage there as well. Something that wasn't even on our radar. And we also know that 80% of patients who are obese have insulin resistance also. So now we're getting a double whammy. We're getting this toxic stuff attacking the brain and we are getting the insulin uh, decrease in the brain that I mentioned earlier. A third thing that's associated with insulin resistance is dyslipidemia or cholesterol problems. And uh, what happens with insulin resistance is right after you eat, you get an abnormal digestive response, which increases the bad component of cholesterol right after you eat. These are LDLs. Be following so far, or am I starting to get glazed over eyes? <laughs> so yeah, I know this gets kind of in intense, but. But it's, it is so unbelievably cool because we're starting to see all these diff different things happening at the different fronts all at the same time, all attacking not only the brain but the rest of the body. So, so what happens with patients who have insulin resistance, and this is also a brand new finding, is that LDLs go up dramatically right after a meal. And what is LDL? LDL is the inflammatory component of cholesterol that cardiologists freak out about, and rightly so, because LDL is what damages the arteries in the whole cardiovascular area. But let's not focus on just the heart, because this is only a small part of our plumbing, isn't it? We've got lots of plumbing here and here, so this almost certainly is uh, associated with uh, vascular disease going into the legs, varicosities, yes, circulation issues, cold hands, and yes, the brain being deprived. So that's part of the whole picture also. So decreased capillary permeation, we call that. Okay, and um, what's fascinating about her research also, and then I'll stop blabbing on about Dr. Susan Kraft, um, is that if these changes happen midlife, so we're talking late 30s through the 40s, it seems to have the most impact on developing Alzheimer's later. Why? We don't know. But much more so than say you're 70 years old and you start developing these things, it doesn't seem to impact the development incidence of Alzheimer's nearly as much as when you're in the 40s and uh, if you've had it for say 10 years or so and then got with it, did lifestyle changes, it still has an impact uh, that's very measurable 20 years later. Very interesting. Trying to figure that one out. We don't know why that is. Okay, so insulin resistance is huge. Uh, this is why we focus in our office on lifestyle therapy, getting patients in to see our lifestyle therapist and get them exercising, have accountability for what they eat and really custom make what they eat for them. So no, it's not just a weight loss program, but it's a getting healthy program because it's not just about the pounds, it's about where you lose it and making sure you're not one of those patients that's thin but fat. I just, I, it was maybe not so, uh, Maybe my bedside manner wasn't so good this morning when I told one of my patients that she was thin but fat. And she's, she's a dear 78 year old patient and I just did a BIA and I should have known better. But it, it's, it's and, and, but I did say it with a smile. Uh, and and, and she, she goes, what? 
And she said, I said, well, um, let me phrase it differently. Uh, um, uh, one of my patients once called a jiggly fat. Um, she goes, oh, yeah, I, I get it. She says, mean like this, and she showed me her arm. And, uh, and said, yeah, like that. You don't have enough muscle. You have too much fat. Even though you're only 124 pounds, which she was, uh, there's just not enough muscle. Your fat percentage is actually too high. I said, throw out the scale and let's start working on muscle and see if we can reverse that trend and make you less inflamed so you're sharper, have more energy, better movement, and able to live life to its fullest potential. So we're developing a weightlifting exercise for her. We're changing what she's eating, and I'm trying to do it in a nice way because she's got some very long, lifelong habits, uh, but we're gonna take off with it, and I'm excited about that, and we're gonna start monitoring her BIA. Why not? Yeah. All right. One more, Doc. Yeah. One thing that, um, you know, I, we like to have uh, tangible things that we can hang on to and find out uh, precursors for uh, Alzheimer's. One of the biggest ones is having just your homocysteine in your blood drawn. If homocysteine is too high, homocysteine is an inflammatory marker in the blood. If homocysteine is too high, it can take the place of glutamate in the brain, and glutamate can be a calming effect over the brain. But if homocysteine is taken over, then it creates an excitatory or inflammatory response in the brain and therefore starts to decrease our neurotransmitter. And the main one in Alzheimer's is acetylcholine. Another thing that uh, you can do supplementally, which we are going to talk about a little bit later, is folic acid. Folic acid supplementation helps to lower homocysteine levels. The uh, interesting fact about that is Folic acid is not the preferred form that crosses into the blood-brain barrier. It's methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is our active form of folic acid. Now, there are 30% of us who cannot make folic acid into its most active form. So that's why it's very important to use products like we have in the office, methyl B or intrinsic B12 folate, which have the active form in there that can help to lower those homocysteine levels and help to get your brain back in balance. Yeah, and homocysteine, again, is a very simple blood test. It also is a good precursor uh, indicator for cardiovascular disease, so that's often how it's, uh, how it's utilized. Um, there's other inflammatory markers too, since we're on that topic. Um, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, that's CRP, is an indicator of inflammation which can attack the brain. Um, and certainly, uh, uh, something called GGTP, which is a uh, uh, liver response to overall toxicity. This is a very new test, can be ordered now. Very excited about this one. GGTP gives us a really good indication of how well our liver is getting rid of toxins, which could potentially affect the brain. Um, so besides that, as well as uh, uh, the heavy metal testing, and uh, if you're so inclined, we do do uh, genetic testing as well to see if you have the genetic predisposition. Now remember, genetic predisposition does not conclude you will get Alzheimer's at all. It just means that you have a bit of a tendency go in that direction. 30% uh, of it's genetics, 70% of it is lifestyle. Folks, we can turn our genes and make them talk a nice, beautiful story um, instead of this tale of horrors that some of these tests can reveal. So it is absolutely amazing what you can do, even in spite of bad genetics, if I can call it bad. Um, but on to the, to the next uh, thing. Let's, so so, so we, we, uh, we've all decided that insulin resistance is bad for Alzheimer's, right? Uh, and can really affect cognitive function. And not just Alzheimer's, by the way, but it can be uh, an inflammatory thing for all kinds of brain conditions. But we're focusing on Alzheimer's just for, for this, this short discussion on this. Um, gluten, uh, now we're hitting a totally different topic. And this is an, uh, an extremely important topic. And this is considered also one of the primary causes of Alzheimer's. Um, uh, I wish you could have been in one of the, our, my treatment rooms this, uh, th this morning and uh, talked to uh, this, this young gal wi with me and says, Doc, you have no idea what a difference in my life it's made to go off of gluten. She has been off now for just two months. Um, she uh, came in to us with severe neurological symptoms. We're talking tremors. We're talking uh, neuropathies. Uh, abnormal sensations, uh, MS symptoms. She had been um, gone to two, two neurologists who concluded that she had a, a weird form of MS. Uh, just cognitive dysfunction where she wasn't remembering things and only 30 years old with two young children. Um, 
so I explained to her that for her, she has all the things that indicate possible gluten sensitivity. She had a sore gut upon palpation, her liver was a little bit enlarged, and uh, what do you do? You pull her off of gluten. And this is not an easy thing to do for a lot of people because we have such an emotional tie-in with our food, don't we? It is so strong. And I recognize that. And um, so when I say it with a smile to the patient, I know very well what I'm doing, but we are doing it for that patient's survival, literally survival. So we pulled her off of gluten and uh, gave her neurological support uh, in, in uh, form of various uh, um, uh, things that we'll discuss in, in a bit. Uh, she's entirely well today, just a few months later. Um, I could tell you one more thing and then we'll go into the mechanism of gluten. Um, we had a call a number of years ago and uh, we had done this 28-day uh, elimination diet where we took away various foods, including gluten, to try to just get rid of inflammation in the body. She was suffering from autoimmune disorders, including depression. And uh, so this is why we did that. And then we came to reintroducing foods and we got this emergency call. And my staff got me and says, you've got to come to the phone. And this is, it's, it's pretty severe, obviously, when I, I've got to get right to the phone on this one. And here was this absolutely hysterical woman uh, on the phone. She says, there's, I'm, I'm driving around right now and there's everything I can take to not drive my car at full speed into a bridge. I says, well, what happened? She says, well, I introduced gluten just an hour ago. We had a profound immune reaction and it was violent and it attacked the brain, causing a severe neurotransmitter shift. I says, well, get over here immediately. Uh, and she did, and we talked to her, and I was more of a psychiatrist for a few minutes than I was obviously a physician, because obviously you have to deal with these situations. And had, uh, this woman has never touched gluten again. Um, uh, didn't take much to convince her after that, obviously. Gluten is unbelievable what it can do for some people. 72% of us have the capability of this immune reaction genetically. 72% of the Western civilization. Does that mean that 72% of us have a problem with it? No, absolutely not. But if you have any kind of neurological sign or symptom, whether it's MS or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or neuropathies or unexplained paralysis, just weird things that just make no sense, gluten is one of the first things you look at because gluten is considered a neurotoxin in some people. A neurotoxin causes behavioral change. This is why with autistic kids, it is the first thing that we pull out. We make them gluten-free and we make them dairy-free and stand back and see where the chips fall. And I would dare say that we have on average about a 50% improvement just with that. In this week's Times Magazine, uh, uh, Jenny is, uh, Jenny, what's her last name? Jenny McCarthy. Jenny McCarthy is interviewed uh, and there's a three or four page article on her on how she proposes the gluten-free and dairy-free diet for treatment of autism. And the whole article is uh, quite uh, critical of her because uh, this is really a dangerous approach. And I'm, I'm going through this and I went through it a couple times. Well, how can this be dangerous? It's a little bit like uh, this um, uh, research that I came across not that long ago. Um, on how vitamin E and selenium uh, may be uh, a potent tool against breast cancer, uh, but right now we are not recommending its use. Thinking, okay, something that's totally natural, we know can do no harm, E selenium, there might be a profound effect against breast cancer, but we're not recommending that you use it because we just don't know for sure. You know, it's just so silly. Why not try this? Go and gluten-free, dairy-free. I know it's taxing on the parent. I know that. But this is your kid. You never give up on your kid. And you can have a profound benefit from it. Um, uh, I have seen even older autistic patients uh, uh, respond to this. So gluten-free, dairy-free can do a lot of good. We had one case uh, of profound Alzheimer's that came in uh, and in this case um, this is about a decade ago comes in non-verbal we're talking advanced Alzheimer's but came in with obvious pain because he was walking really crooked and that's why the kids asked me who are patients here I said can we do something for dad because he's obviously in pain but he's not able to verbalize because of his advanced Alzheimer's we did a BIA on him 
and one to this date he is the most di dehydrated patient I've ever come across his total di hydration level is at 34 um, percent the minimum allowed is 50 so extremely dehydrated and the first thing I said okay let's get this guy hydrated I want an IV in him and then I want X amount of water and we did that and I pulled him off of gluten simply because of the Alzheimer diagnosis would you believe it that in three weeks time he became a normal conversant patient he'd had the diagnosis of Alzheimer's for almost a decade it's just unbelievable so here is a case of Alzheimer's quote unquote cured by one of the most common nutritional deficiencies by the way and that's water and so hydration in parentheses here is really critical for brain function um, and pulling off of gluten and I'm thinking that water was the main component here by the way so um, uh, I've had this same kind of result to a lesser degree with some other patients as well uh, it's just that one was so stark uh, absolutely amazing so gluten uh, is not just about celiac disease that's how you're going to hear it most commonly aren't you celiac disease is a gluten thing and this is this is something that you can test with a biopsy in the gut folks this is not what I'm talking about although it is proven fact that the celiac disease if you continue to go on in that path your chances of Alzheimer's are about five-fold compared to the average population okay which is very significant um, gluten uh, has many different antibodies, many different ways of reacting and it is an extremely complex molecule. Uh, we have one way of showing a sensitivity to it here but even that is only 20% of the picture at best. Really the best way to figure out if you have a gluten sensitivity is to go off of it for six weeks and you have to do it 100% not a crumb because if you have a little bit and you have this reaction it means you can have 10 days of inflammation let's say you do that once or twice a week it just does no good it has to be 100 percent when you decide to do this let's say you do not have a gluten sensitivity was this just an exercise in futility absolutely not because one now you know that you're not sensitive to gluten right and number two your gut function will improve a minimum of 40%. So we're talking good bacteria and enzymes while you're off of gluten, even if you're not sensitive to gluten. And why is that? It's because gluten is a very complex spiral molecule. If you look under, uh, at it under a micron microscope, it goes like this. It's a very complex molecule. And we need to hit enzymes at many different levels to cleave it into pieces. It's a lot of work for the digestive si uh, system to truly digest gluten especially the refined kind like you find in donuts and stuff um, so so let's let when, when you take gluten out all of a sudden the digestive system has so much easier time just digesting everything else it's able to get rid of toxins good bacteria come back in your enzyme levels are topped back up and you can really benefit health-wise doing this exercise so something that I highly recommend to all people to try at some point because 72 percent of us have that gene that's nothing to sneeze at and all it takes is a special condition a special stressor whatever direction it comes from to trigger that so gluten is also implicated in all kinds of behavioral disorders not just Alzheimer's disease but we know that between insulin resistance Alzheimer's disease and toxic metals and I think Dr. Stacy's going to mention one of those uh, right away besides the mercury uh, we're uh, we're really covering a lot of ground there while you're flipping because you gotta go through about three slides um things to avoid if you, if you think you possibly have alzheimer's predisposition aluminum was one of the big ones that came up i know they talk mm -hmm. a lot about mercury you know what we replaced mercury with in our vaccination yeah. and the reason why is because we have never researched or looked to find what is our toxic threshold? We just believe that the body can get rid of aluminum naturally without a problem. The liver flushes it out, no issues. But they are seeing in Alzheimer's patients that they have a higher amount of aluminum in their brain. Now, we have not done any testing on somebody who doesn't have Alzheimer's to see if they have any aluminum in their brain and, and what kind of effects that may have had at the same levels as an Alzheimer's patient, but that's what they have found in Alzheimer's brains. 
The other yeah. thing. If I can interject in yes, aluminum. Please. Um, 24 years ago, uh, I was doing the math as, as you were going through this, uh, 24 years ago I did a uh, research topic presentation on aluminum and its effects on Alzheimer's and there was a definite difference that I could find in the literature 24 years ago uh, on uh, the use of antiperspirants which, has lo with, which is loaded with aluminum as well uh, w with Alzheimer's. Uh, the, it was a definite statistical difference with those that were using the deodorants versus ones that were not. Uh, so that was very interesting and that was just a small indicator that heavy metals is a problem. It goes into the skin. F folks, we use drugs, right, The skin patches. Uh, how about the nicotine patch? Uh, all that, things go through our skin, we sometimes forget that. And yes, the things that we apply here can have a profound effect on our system, especially if you have some sort of sensitivity to aluminum or have trouble eliminating it. Yeah. Other things to avoid are um, aggressive movies, vulgar language. Those mm -hmm. things deplete the neurotransmitter in the brain, acetylcholine, and that can, if you already have that predisposition, predisposition make it even worse. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that also goes for heavy metal music. Yes. Uh, no, honest. Re uh, research has shown that the, the, the beat in heavy metal music depletes you from certain neurotransmitters which can really affect cognitive disorders, even depression. So, I, uh, I think it's fascinating, that kind of research. Yeah. So, depression we kind of covered. Um, uh, depression is, is an extremely complex, big topic. Uh, the gluten uh, is one of the first things to look at over there. The gut connection is extremely potent with depression. Uh, in fact, uh, in the Netherlands uh, and most Western European countries, uh, depression is considered a gut disorder first. That's where you go first, and if that, unless there's extenuating circumstances environment-wise uh, where there's an extreme stressor uh, externally, obviously uh, that's a different type of depression. Now we're talking a physical type of depression. Often there's a combination of both going on in patients' uh, um, uh, lives. So uh, for the external stressors, uh, counseling, um, there's pl plenty of studies out there that show counseling to be as or more effective as medication. Um, so obviously the external stressors should not be medicated away, but it has to be dealt with. Um, bipolar disorders is one that vexes a lot of uh, uh, psychiatrists. It's one of the more difficult, uh, besides schizophrenia, uh, conditions to deal with. Um, uh, these are extremely rewarding to work with. Uh, they respond remarkably well to a specific kind of oil called phosphatidylserine. Um, uh, phosphatidylserine or choline is another name for it. Um, along with uh, giving just a little bit of natural lithium. Lithium is also found in drug form by the way. Uh, but the natural form is much more mild and hits on many more different fronts in the brain. And going gluten free. Um, I dare say that uh, most bipolar patients that come in here uh, have a very quick response to that and it's very revealing to them um, how their bipolar symptoms are, uh, uh, are, are remediated with it. Now there is a word of caution that I like to say and this is strictly personal opinion and not research. I think bipolar is actually overdiagnosed. Um, uh, there's, it's an easy thing to go to. Uh, uh, I'm seeing what I think is way too many of these diagnoses. Um, so um, I sometimes uh, wonder about the diagnosis of bipolar. Doctor, yeah. when you see a lot of bipolar patients in your experience, do you notice that a lot of them pre their bipolar diagnosis have been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD? Yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of bipolar patients, uh, when, they, when you uh, get, uh, uh, when you look into their history, a lot of them are in uh, ADD or ADHD in previous history. Um, so that seems to be a precursor to it or perhaps the medication used for it such as Ritalin uh, which by the way is in the same classification as meth, crack. Uh, it is uh, an amazingly strong drug, it's, a, it's a, one of our class 1 drugs, um, uh, maybe damage from that can do it as well. Yeah. Sure Schizophrenia is, a, is, a, is an extremely complicated topic. I, uh, the research on it is all over the place and um, I, I was uh, going back to uh, an, um, a researcher who was 94 years old um, and in the 50s started doing a lot of, he's a psychiatrist, doing research on schizophrenia and found 
an incredible improvement with niacin. We find that 50% of symptoms can be improved in schizophrenia just with niacin. Where did this research go? What happened to it? It's collecting in a dustbin of history, totally ignored and just now being picked up again. Niacin is huge and then a Dr. Linus Pauling, you might remember that name in the 60s, this guy got two Nobel Prizes, the only fella in the world to have received two independent Nobel Prizes, so obviously brilliant, found that vitamin C combined with niacin had an even larger response rate with schizophrenia. He's also the father of something called orthomolecular medicine, which is really the forefather of functional medicine as we know it today. Um, schizophrenia is very treatable, folks. It is very treatable. It's a very complex, uh, almost, I consider it almost autism-like syndrome where there's all kinds of neurotransmitter imbalances happening on many different fronts. Uh, very fascinating. Uh, when you're really listening to patients with schizophrenia, uh, they tend to be very bright. They tend to uh, make sense in their own kind of weird way uh, when you really listen to them. And you are looking at profound nutritional deficiencies. That is what you're looking at. In order to try to cover that, it takes some very major pharmaceuticals that have unbelievable side effects, which just dumbs them down to barely functional human beings. Uh, amazing what you can do with mega dose vitamin therapy there. Some of them it starts in the gut wall, others it's just the way their genes are expressing themselves requiring a much higher need of certain vitamins in the thousands of time of the RDA but it is uh, a very fascinating uh, thing to, uh, to, to treat. Autism, I've already covered that to some degree. Autism obviously is now uh, a, an absolute out of control situation. When I started practice, it was one in 5,000. Uh, 21 years later, uh, it is now one in 88. The statistic just got updated about eight weeks ago. One in 88. It was one in 130 just last year. So we have an out of control situation here. It is very sad. The autistic spectrum disorders have become broader and broader. And uh, the reason for that is uh, the accumulating toxin, which worsens with every generation. Time magazine had a fantastic article on it, cover magazine, three weeks ago. Uh, it was on the cover, and I was so pleased with that. That showed how the things that what we do today has such a profound off, uh, 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 relaying effect up to six generations later. later uh, it showed that boys, uh, when they start smoking around age 12, 13, or 14, right when sperm development is starting to occur, that they can then have a profound effect on their kids, measurable up to four generations later just because they started smoking at age 12, 13, or 14, much more so than if they started smoking at age 18 or 19. Yeah, those, that's just a tiny little example of what's happening to our generation today. We have an accumul accumulation of organic polyphenols, uh, POPs, uh, it's also uh, called. These are organic pollutants, um, and these polyphenols are just so toxic. They're found in our environment, and they accumulate in our bodies. We hold on to them in our fat cells. Unfortunately, when you become pregnant, and yes, I'm talking to the woman now, when you become pregnant, what happens is 20% of your pops gets dumped into that tiny little baby body. It is absolutely scary. And then that little baby, when they have kids, take that and pass it on to their generation. So you can see how the toxic element increases unbelievably from generation to generation and we've had about four generations of pops now and we're seeing the results of decreasing fertility we're seeing an increase in autism and all kinds of inflammatory diseases from that so we have a great responsibility with our bodies don't we because we have the lockbox to their genetics so we had an interruption in the seminar uh, due to uh, technical difficulties as they say and um, so I'm summing some things up uh, after the fact because I do want you to get the complete seminar. And what I had intended here was to wrap up the seminar, give you more of a whole view of it again because there's so much information. It's a very technical and literally we are scratching the surface. Um, but I, what I really want you to do is, is get 
a whole view of it that the body affects the brain in a huge way and it really is wrong to talk about the brain as a separate unit. Now, having said that, you still do need to occasionally use specialty products to affect the brain because when the body has been off balance for so long, let's say you've had a gluten sensitivity, it has assaulted your brain for many years and now we are stuck with an inflammatory process, just taking gluten away might not be good enough. Uh, or your adrenal function has been so shattered by stress uh, and then finally now you are working on your adrenals but still it has driven the neurotransmitter balance in your brain so off key that something needs to be done to get it back in balance uh, it just needs a push on its own so there are some products that I want you to know about um, some of these are uh, through our recommendations only and some of them can just be picked up the first one uh, which is one of our uh, more exciting uh, ones that we use is called methyl B and methyl B uh, is something uh, that we have utilized for over a decade now and it really is folate and its precursor 5 tetrahydrofolate it does cross the blood, uh, blood brain barrier so we know it has an immediate effect there and in Europe studies have proven that it is remarkable for prevention of Alzheimer's it also helps patients get rid of brain fog so if somebody uh, uh, has had extensive chemo and or radiation treatment for cancer and are suffering with brain fog it is amazing what that will do. It also happens to do a lot more than that. It helps methylation, so that is uh, a recharging of the neurotransmitters uh, as well as hormones. Uh, it helps prevent DNA damage, uh, so it helps with a lot of uh, symptoms of premature aging as well. So methyl B is very much one of our favorites, very anti-cancerous overall as well. And another one that is in that same line is intrinsic B12 folate. Uh, this has B12 along with it. Now as you may know B12 is a tricky one because it really has a lot of problems with absorption um, and so you either have to inject it or use a sublingual but even a sublingual uses maybe only 7% of what's in the tablet but research has proven that if you use it with intrinsic factor you're absorbing a huge quantity of it maybe up to 70 percent and I have found in my clinical practice that equal it will equal injections so intrinsic B12 folate really brightens the brain it is substantial in what it can do to lift depression uh, and uh, yeah patients say they just feel brighter and more energetic with it it increases something called methylation again and may assist in sulfation as well which are detoxification mechanisms now from University of Groningen which is the northern part of the Netherlands as well as some of the medical schools in Poland and our very own University of Iowa Medical School comes research that uh, casein hydroxytripsalate um, this is um, uh, excuse me I, I misspoke on that one it's protein rich hydrolysate uh, this is a polypeptide complex in Cogniture and uh, Cogniture is a sublingual so you chew it and in research with beginning Alzheimer's it is showing you can actually reverse the symptoms of beginning Alzheimer's and it can do it so quickly that the rush of memories coming back the acuity of thinking that comes back can happen almost too quickly and produce a slight state of anxiety so I ease patients into this uh, changes are usually noticeable within a week already very excited about this one uh, we've used it for several years now and have been able to stabilize our Alzheimer's patients with this uh, it has no known side effects it is of course natural and we have some very solid research uh, that are on the cusp of technology uh, showing how this works. Feeding the brain is very important with oils also so that's why we recommend the Mediterranean diet, lots of good oils in the diet, olive oil, salmon, fish. Um, and one of those components of fish oil called DHA can now be extracted from krill. Uh, it can also be extracted from fish but krill is a safer source and DHA is what makes up the biggest component of oils in the brain. The brain as you may know is 80% fats and uh, this can help with any kind of short circuits, uh, circuiting that can occur. 
for some reason this does not work well with schizophrenia so a word of caution here with schizophrenia we do not use high DHA um, it's um, mechanism of schizophrenia is unknown but it's just a word of caution we use EPA on those patients uh, DHA helps with cognition it helps with memory it helps with mood stabilization as well as ability to focus we use it with a lot of kids by the way so the next one that I want to discuss is vitamin D and vitamin D is uh, luckily uh, talked about a lot uh, we've been utilizing this for over 20 years in our practice and um, we always got a lot of calls of alarm when we were recommending this because aren't you making your patients toxic uh, isn't uh, anything over the RDA way too much and you know this for example is, there's 5,000 in here 5,000 active units it's mixed with a little bit of um, uh, oil uh, from soy which enhances absorption maybe up to another 40% uh, so it's highly absorbable but this really is not much more than 20 minutes of sunshine no, I'm not overdosing you. And the effects on the patients are incredible from bone health to cellular regeneration health to immune modulation to mood modulation. If people come in with seasonal affective disorder, five days and it's greatly improved. Patients that I put on, uh, I put patients on this, they usually never go back. In fact, most of them take it even through the summer to some degree, even though I tell them they may not need to if they get some sunshine. If you do use sunscreen on your body, you are getting zero vitamin D. Just be aware of that. Use sunscreen only in areas where you need it, like nose, tops of ears, maybe the shoulders so you don't burn. But really, if it looks like you're gonna burn, get out of the sun or get covered. That's really the wisest choice. Okay. Neurofocus is uh, our Ritalin alternative. Of course, there's no side effects with this one, um, but uh, it uh, has L-theanine in, in it, as well as EPA oil, as well as DHA. And uh, it is remarkable how it can work. The casein triptych hydrolysate has an effect on the brain, which is a little bit slower acting. You don't notice this immediately, but over time, about a month's time, you get better and better concentration. This effect is profound, has replaced Ritalin for a lot of my patients. Again, no side effects. And this really can work towards making your brain work like it's supposed to. A lot of patients find that after a while they don't even need this anymore. It's like reprogramming your brain. Anxiety disorders. There's a huge market in the pharmaceutical industry for anxiety disorders. Xanax is just one example and multiple side effects. Most patients desperately want to get off these drugs. Uh, Xanax uh, is not one of our favorite drugs. Uh, there's many others. We can wean patients off these anxiety drugs very quickly using something called NeuroCalm. Its active ingredient is uh, epigallocatechin gallate. It's a green tea extract as well as NAC. And this affects the neurotransmitter called GABA, uh, which is part of our anxiety neurotransmitter, and helps calm down the uh, uh, effects of uh, the ad adrenaline, uh, cortisol, on the brain as well. You can stop an anxiety attack with this. You can uh, see noticeable results with anxiety disorder in just a matter of days. Um, so like that one a lot uh, you can use the, this as needed or steadily uh, none of these have any addictive properties uh, or they stop working after a while it is something you don't need to worry about I know the list is long but remember the brain is complicated so here comes another one Neuromem this one is more protective this is uh, this has been studied by Mayo it's Huprazine A in a very special form there's different forms of Huprazine this is the only one that's been documented to work uh, on prevention of Alzheimer's so if sense of smell is dissipating taste is dissipating starting to forget things a little bit there's a history of Alzheimer's in your family Huprazine A as found in this product has a very powerful neuroprotective benefit helps memory cognition also but it's the protection that this one focuses on Senatol is a real in uh, interesting one this is inositol along with some other key ingredients such as magnesium and this works on a secondary messenger transport system within the brain which is just a fancy way of saying it supports uh, uh, neurotransmitters that are unstable that are flip-flopping 
uh, bipolar disorders. Remarkable how that works with these patients. Um, this is also your Ritalin alternative. I've had patients uh, tell me even just recently, I didn't think I could think this clearly. This is way better than Ritalin. So it does work in those kind of disorders as well. Uh, but anyone who has more mood swings uh, and brain fog, Senatol is what I like using one to three scoops a day. The ones that are doctor controlled are Senatol, Neuromem, Neurocalm and Neurofocus. The other ones you can pick up freely. So back to the brain as a whole, really what you need to get out of this is that foods can have a profound impact on your brain function. Your body has a profound impact on brain function. Adrenaline, thyroid, gut, spinal alignment. I can go on and on. Stress levels, obviously, which affects the adrenals. It has to be addressed for proper brain function to occur. Without addressing that first, optimum brain function can never be achieved. So look at the whole picture. Maybe look at those books that I recommended at the beginning of the seminar. And let's achieve what we can achieve. You'd be amazed what your brain can do.